Terrific. Welcome, everyone. Um, we're very excited. I feel like a, I'm a news broadcaster. Okay. Uh, we're excited that you are here with us today. Um, first, I want to thank um, the funders of the Art at Noon Lectures. Art at Noon Lectures are supported by the Barron family in memory of Rose Susan Hershorn Barron, a former docent at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts and a great supporter of our art education programs. I'm super excited to introduce Dr. Greg Barnheisel, um, uh, who is here today um, to talk about Cold War modernism. Dr. Barnheisel is a professor of English at the du Duquesne, Duquesne. How do you say? Duquesne. Duquesne. I knew there was, there was no S. Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and the author of James Laughlin, New Directions, and the remaking of Ezra Pound, 2005, and Cold War Modernist Art Literature and American Cultural Diplomacy in 2015, and editor of the scholarly journal, Book History. He is recipient of grants and fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Yale University, the Houghton Library, and the Harry Ransom Center. His biography of the literary figure and spy Norman Holmes Pearson will be published by the University of Chicago Press in the fall of 2024. I also am gonna put into the chat, we're very excited that um, uh, his book, Cold War Modernist, will be out in paperback um, in January, right? Uh, February. February, So, but you can pre-order it here using this link. So welcome, Greg. Well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thanks very much and uh, hi to everybody. Uh, and it's uh, it's really grim and snowing here in Pittsburgh, so uh, I'm feeling very W.C. Fields, and and uh, I, on the whole, I'd rather be in Philadelphia right now. Um, so I'm I'm very excited to talk to you today about uh, modernism, about the Cold War, and about Cold War modernism. And um, but I want to start by thanking Laura Wasselchuk for asking me to be part of this lecture series. And, uh, and Brittany Webb as well for asking me to contribute to the Rodin exhibition catalog because it gave me the chance to learn about John Rodin and experience his sculptures and I'd never heard of him before. And it's been a wonderful uh, experience to get to know his work and his life. So my talk today is, as Laurie said, it's drawn from a book that I published now almost 10 years ago, long before I'd ever heard of John Rodin. So if you're expecting to hear a huge amount about him, I should apologize in advance, although I do mention him several times. Uh, but what I'm trying to do is give some background for you all on the larger context of Rodin's sculptures and especially his work in the 1950s and 1960s as a cultural diplomat for the United States government and how the idea of modernism fits into all of that. Uh, and, and, and as Laurie said, if you find yourself desperate to hear more stories about Cold War modernism, uh, there is a link to that book, which, uh, which, as she said, is going to paperback in, um, in February. And so uh, perhaps an advance order is just what somebody wants in their stocking or an origin next to the menorah. So I'm going to pull up my um, PowerPoint. Can everybody see this? Yes. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay, so there are a few better places in the world to talk about modernism in the arts than Philadelphia. But what is modernism? Is it the uh, PSFS building, which is now the Lowe's Philadelphia Hotel, which was the first international style skyscraper? Is it the Marcel Duchamp installations and paintings at the Philadelphia Museum of Art? Would it be the manuscripts of James Joyce's handwritten uh, Ulysses? Uh, which he finished in 1922 and which came to Philadelphia just two years later in 1924 when um, Rosenbach bought them for his museum, well, what became his museum? Or is it the neighborhoods around the University of Pennsylvania where aspiring poets Ezra Pound, H.D., Marianne Moore, and William Carlos Williams formed a tight clique in the early years of the last century? So these are all undeniably modernist, but what is the DNA that they all share? What makes and made audiences recognize them as modernist? Modernism didn't even go by that name, in fact, until well into the 1950s. But like Justice Potter Stewart's pornography, early 20th century audiences knew modernism when they saw it, even if it had no fixed political or cultural meaning. 
the widely disparate modernist movements in the arts that arose, that arose in Paris, London, Berlin, Zurich, and elsewhere had little in common apart from formal experimentation and a rejection of traditional methods of representing reality. But they also shared a rebellion against all existing standards and institutions and a relentless pursuit of the new for its own sake. Audiences saw in modernism a fundamentally antinomian attitude, as, as Irving Howe put it, an unyielding rage against the existing order, an unrelenting drive to reject, break down, toss out all in search of the new. But yet, if modernism wanted to undermine middle class culture and society, it was an utter failure. If anything, modernism came not to bury, but to adorn bourgeois life colonizing its houses and its products, its entertainments, and even its public spaces, as with, for instance, John Roden's public sculptures. From a cause that intended to remake the world, the sociologist Nathan Glazer wrote in 2007, modernism has become a style. So what happened? How did modernism move from being a cause to a style? In the 1950s, modernism shed most of its associations with nihilism and rebellion, and eventually was used in support of its original enemy, Western middle-class values. Even as it retained its associations with innovation and the drive for the new, modern also, modernism also came to be presented as a pro-freedom, pro-bourgeois movement, evidence of the superiority of the Western way of life. Many institutions helped move modernism from the fringes to the center in the 1940s and the 1950s. The publishing industry, academia, the mass media, arts and cultural foundations, the theater world and others, including museums like Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. But Cold War imperatives accelerated this development. In fact, modernism became a weapon in the so-called cultural Cold War. The struggle for prestige and influence between the Soviet Union and its Eastern Bloc satellites on the one side and the United States and the nations of Western Europe on the other. Its battles ranged from heated exchanges at international conferences to dueling theatrical productions to competing literary and cultural journals. A key prize in this war were the sympathies of influential leftist Western European intellectuals who reviled what they saw as the United States' shallow and business-dominated culture and what they called its coca colonization of the rest of the world but who were also leery of Stalinist domination and militarism. In response, American cultural diplomats offered modernism in painting, literature, architecture, and music as evidence of the high cultural achievement of the United States. Both governmental and private organizations argued that the very anti-traditionalism that once made modernist art and literature so threatening proved that, uh, that um, Western culture was superior to the culture being forged in the Soviet Union and its satellite nations. So I call these 1940s and 1950s programs that used modernism for pro-Western propaganda, as well as the politically driven reinterpretation of the modernist movement that undergirded these programs, Cold War modernism. Cold War modernism extended across the arts and this rhetorical reframing took place in magazines and touring exhibitions and shows and books, film and on the radio. Today, I'm gonna to talk about Cold War modernism's official, that is governmental manifestations, but just as important were private groups and people like the publisher, James Laughlin, the Ford Foundation, the Museum of Modern Art and its director, Alfred Barr, and its president, Nelson Rockefeller, the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was, as is now well known, supported by the Central Intelligence Agency, the father of neoconservatism, Irving Kristol, and even William Casey, who was an OSS London veteran who after many years in the business world became President Reagan's director of the Central Intelligence Agency. They were all unified around the consensus, uh, they were all unified by the consensus around liberal anti-communism, the political stance that was best expressed in Arthur Schlesinger's 1949 book, The Vital Center. High-minded artists and writers and government bureaucrats and foundation directors and business executives didn't need to discuss what they believed, because liberal anti-communism was the water in which they swam. Mm -hmm. But the official Cold War modernist program didn't start out all that well. In 1946, the Department of State hired Leroy Davidson, who had been the curator at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, 
to assemble a collection of American art to circulate to European capitals. Davidson purchased 79 oil paintings by artists like Jack Levine, Ben Shahn, Marsden Hartley, Arthur Dove, and Yasuo Kuniyoshi. Several artists agreed to even sell their paintings to the State Department at a discount. So Georgia O'Keeffe sold two of her paintings for $1,000, even though the going rate at the time was in the neighborhood of $10,000 apiece. The paintings in total cost the Department of State $49,000, which is a lot more in those, month, in those dollars, but they're a lot more expensive today. The idea was to prove to European intellectuals that contrary to their prejudices, the U.S. actually did have advanced culture and a sophisticated art scene, and that American freedom and individualism were the soil in which such innovative art grew. We weren't just chewing gum and cowboy movies and the A-bomb, in other words. In many countries overseas, it is the common misconception that our artists are second raters who have no creative individualism, Assistant Secretary of State William Benton explained to a congressional critic. This exhibit illustrates the freedom in which our American artists work. In addition, the exhibition catalog stressed the melting pot image of American culture, calling attention to the fact that many of the artists included were in fact immigrants whose creative expression flowered under American freedom. The State Department, though, had not anticipated the fact that a lot of Americans were not all that fond of modernism. William Randolph Hearst's papers started the attacks, but the February 1947 Look magazine article, Your Money Bought These Paintings, brought the show to the notice of the broad public and to Congress. New York Congressman John Tabor told Secretary of State George Marshall that the paintings were a travesty upon art. A conservative arts group called the American Artists Professional League questioned the cultural value of any exhibition which is so strongly marked with the radicalism of new trends of European art which are not indigenous to our soil. There's nativism, uh, it just permeates this rhetoric. One article ridiculing the show said it plainly, the paintings were not American at all, but rooted in the alien cultures, ideas, philosophies, and sicknesses of Europe. Among these philosophies and sicknesses, conservatives hinted, was communism. The popular outcry then quickly began to sway the diplomatic establishment. In public, the Secretary of State Benton gave the collection a qualified defense. Internally, though, he complained that Leroy Davidson should have known enough to have brought pictures of several types so that there would be some that appealed to everybody. Finally, the administration disowned the show when, when President Truman made a snide remark about the Kuniyoshi painting, Circus Girl Resting, and added, there is no art at all in connection with the modernists, in my opinion. Quickly, not only the show itself, but the very infrastructure that had been created to use American modernist art as cultural propaganda fell apart. The art specialist position that Davidson had been given was eliminated. The paintings were sold off as war surplus, interestingly enough, at a 90% discount, and now most of them reside at the University of Oklahoma and Auburn University Art Museums today. The State Department's retreat infuriated the cultural establishment. The art world insisted that modernism was neither communistic nor fundamentally foreign. We reject the assumption that art, which is aesthetically an innovation, must somehow be socially or politically subversive and therefore un-American, a 1950 statement jointly authored by the officials at MoMA, the Whitney, and Boston's um, Institute of Contemporary Arts said. Alfred Barr, the director of MoMA, wrote in the New York Times that modern art was characterized most by a love of freedom and could be no way communistic. And Nelson Rockefeller memorably called abstract expressionism free enterprise painting. Rockefeller might have been stretching, but he wasn't entirely wrong. The State Department had noted that works by the artists included in advancing American art were present in corporate collections, such as those of IBM, Abbott Laboratories, Pepsi-Cola, and Latowska Pearls. And corporate use of modernism even predated the 1940s. In fact, Walter Pepke's Container Corporation of America, starting in 1937, used very challenging modernist art in its museum ads. And this uh, Ben Sean uh, painting is just one example. They had a whole series of these that they would run in high profile magazines like New Yorker and Life. In fact, Davidson, at the same time he put together the advancing show, had organized two other shows that highlighted modernist artworks held in the collections of corporations and industrialists. 
These exhibitions sought to illustrate that the same values of freedom and individualism, which fostered America's predominance in business, were creating a great art scene, and that American business and corporate capitalism itself were not inherently Philistine. So then gradually, over the course of the 1950s, modernist art crept back into American cultural diplomacy, often in disguise. A 1951 show in still-occupied Berlin included many of the artists from the advancing show, but the State Department concealed its role in organizing the show. But ironically, the election of Dwight Eisenhower, a man usually seen as being far from an intellectual, really accelerated the Cold War modernist program. Eisenhower convened high-level task forces on cultural diplomacy and, and uh, created the United States Information Agency to coordinate information and cultural programs. These grew uh, gradually braver over the years. Sport in Art, a show jointly sponsored by USIA and Sports Illustrated magazine, was meant to complement the Melbourne Olympics and it previewed in Dallas in 1955, but because it was Dallas, a conservative local group objected to the inclusion of leftist artists like Ben Sean and non-representational works. And so USIA director Theodore Strybert backpedaled and demanded that those artists be removed. However, he ignored the complaints about the artworks in general. What was different about this episode was that it was no longer the modernism that was the problem. It was the particular modernists. No longer was modernist technique such as abstraction or distortion or non-representationalism non in itself a reason to pull a work. Furthermore, liberals in Congress like Hubert Humphrey now got up to attack Strybert for his timidity. Even Eisenhower talked about how the freedom of the arts is a basic freedom, one of the pillars of liberty in our land. And many of you may know that Eisenhower was a somewhat accomplished amateur painter. The anti-modernist position domestically was weakening. In government-sponsored shows throughout the rest of the 1950s, this trend continued. The American exhibition at the Brussels World's Fair was held in a modernist building, that's pictured in, this, in the slide, and included a show of paintings by artists like Kuniyoshi, Sean, Richard Diebenkorn, Robert Motherwell, Grace Hartigan, and Ad Reinhardt. It went a bit far, though, for Eisenhower, who granted there is a place for the modernistic and expressionistic school, but the fair was probably not the right venue to try to teach sophistication to the public of Europe or to American tourists. But instead of demanding changes, he allowed the show to go on as originally designed. It was at this time that the State Department asked John Roden to take part in its art specialist program and sent him to Eastern Europe, Africa, and Asia to talk about the arts in the United States and his own accomplishments as a sculptor. What did Roden talk about on these visits? He relished describing the technical details of his own work and focused on how contemporary American architecture incorporated sculpture, perhaps anticipating his own future career of making large-scale works set within building complexes. But artists in the Eastern Bloc in Africa were particularly curious about how an artist makes a living in a capitalist society. Here, Rodin provided collateral benefits that his handlers could not have anticipated. He emphasized how capitalism supported the arts through commissions, through purchases of works, and even through the inspiration provided by industrial forms and processes. And if USIA's leaders wanted a black sculptor who would show that reports of racial prejudice in the United States were overblown, they got him. Rodin had, perhaps more than any other black artist apart from Ralph Ellison, benefited from his connections with the foundation, university, government alliance that had emerged in the 1940s and 1950s. Columbia University, the American Academy in Rome, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Tiffany Foundation, and now the State Department had all supported his works, as well as innumerable museums, hospitals, and municipal governments. How racist could America be if its elite cultural institutions lined up to support a black sculptor from Alabama? Finally, the 1959 American National Exhibition in Moscow, which was the site for the Nixon-Khrushchev kitchen debate, provided the show venue for the show of 48 young American painters, including many of the names that had caused the most trouble for the art program over the last 12 years, such as William Zorak, Sean, Levine, and Kuniyoshi. 
Everybody played their assigned parts in talking about this. Pennsylvania Representative Francis Walter asserted that the show included 22 artists with significant records of affiliation with communism. The American Artists Professional League pointed to the dismal, dreary, and technically trivial array of paintings in the red saturated exhibition, but had been as, but had but as had been increasingly the case throughout the 1950s, influential voices in culture and the government spoke up in support of the show. Unlike with the 1955 Sport and Art exhibition, moreover, the United States Information Agency did not demand prior approval over the artists and in the end refused to withdraw the show, even at the demands of conservative congressmen, citing the potential PR damage that would come from such a reversal. So to sum up, in the art program, modernism went from being abhorrent in itself in 1946 to being in the 1950s, an elite taste, but some modernists being unacceptable because they were foreign or leftist. And then by 1959, to modernists, even the leftist ones, being the art that we used to tell the Soviet people who we were as a culture. So things worked a little differently in the books program, which became an urgent priority as the Cold War began. The Soviets had long exported their ideas through subsidized books, and by 1950 had produced and distributed over 40 million books abroad. Four years later, the USSR was producing approximately 40 million books every year in free world languages. In 1952, the US Psychological Strategy Board warned that the largest selling book in the world with the possible exception of the Bible has been the short history of the Communist Party by Joseph Stalin. During the Cold War, the United States made books available to foreign audiences in multiple ways. The intended audience was definitely the intellectual elite, judged by the program's directors to be an infinitely more important target than the herd, because new thoughts cannot be brought directly to the masses without being filtered through the elites. The books included in these programs countered the charge that the United States was a cultural wasteland and presented the United States as a well-meaning liberal democracy whose civil liberties and domestic democratic institutions ensured that it would mature past whatever shortcomings it might currently exhibit. But of all of the branches of the Cold War modernist project, the books program was by far the most conservative and tentative in terms of how it used modernism. The generally conservative attitude towards modernism in the books program makes it particularly striking that the author who played the biggest part in that program, and in fact, contributed more than any other to the 1950s cultural diplomacy program, was William Faulkner. Faulkner's works, of course, are notoriously difficult and highlight the one topic that USIA wanted desperately to avoid, the racial situation in the South. But Faulkner's eloquent Nobel Prize address and uh, but Faulkner's eloquent Nobel Prize address melded with, with President Truman's campaign of truth message, which argued that the Soviets were the greatest threat to peace in the world, and that only the humanistic values of free people could stave off the threat of destruction hanging over the earth. Furthermore, Faulkner's prestige abroad, particularly among foreign writers, made him a very powerful cultural ambassador. Although he was reluctant at first and didn't even want to go to Stockholm to collect his Nobel Prize, Faulkner would soon travel abroad frequently on behalf of the United States Information Agency. His first such trip was to Sao Paulo, Brazil, the 1954 International Writers Conference. And this is a picture of him getting on the plane uh, at the, I think, Jackson, Mississippi, or maybe the New Orleans airport. In keeping with states' generally conservative approach to literature, the publicity materials circulated to the Public Affairs Office framed Faulkner not as a paragon of modernist experimentation, but primarily as a Southern realist, a regionalist. They sent over nonfiction books about the Yazoo River country and Mississippi. But knowing that the Brazilian public would be focused on race, the department included a transcript of a Voice of America discussion of Faulkner's The Bear between Ralph Ellison and Irving Howe. It's a particularly important item, the instructions to diplomats specified, since Ellison, speaking as a Negro novelist, tells why he considers the bear to be a central story in Faulkner's work. The following year, Faulkner spent three weeks at a seminar in Japan before returning home via Europe. His responses in press conferences and Q&As delighted the USIA. In all of his discussions, an internal report noted, 
He unflinchingly answered questions on his works, his style, his philosophy, and American life in general. On two occasions, he hit hard against communism, socialism, and any form of radicalism in general, defending democracy as the best system yet devised by a man for all of its faults. In Rome, Faulkner even gave a, a strong condemnatory statement immediately after the murder of Emmett Till, undermining Soviet accusations that the United States would not confront its racial problems. In the end, Faulkner's trips on behalf of the USIA did much to advance the Cold War modernist project to prove to leftist intellectuals abroad that the United States had produced legitimate cultural achievements and that experimental modernism wasn't a rejection of, but rather epitomized the success of Western liberal democracy and individualism. Furthermore, Faulkner's involvement in particular helped the project of bolstering US cultural prestige transition easily from its original target audiences, which was European opinion makers, to an audience that became increasingly important in the 1960s, writers and cultural elites in the decolonizing nations of Latin America, the Middle East, and East Asia. Faulkner had a particularly fervent following in Latin America. In fact, American modernist writers, artists, and performers helped legitimize all of American culture. While the primary audience for these Cold War modernist projects was intellectuals and opinion makers, U.S. cultural diplomats knew they had to reach out to a broader audience as well. To do this, they used the most powerful medium of the time, radio. In 1952, Voice of America director Foy Kohler insisted that radio is the principal medium for the conduct of the Cold War. VOA, which was broadcast around the world, around the clock in local languages, featured relatively little coverage of art and culture, but precisely because it was aimed at such a broad audience and conveyed a highly American middle brow sensibility about art and literature, we conceive Voice of America as the institution that closed the deal on Cold War modernism, that confirmed that the once threatening modernism had indeed become the house style of the American bourgeoisie and could be exported to the rest of the world as such. In its features on art, artists, writers, critics, and key ideas about American culture, Voice of America increasingly over the course of the 1950s sounded the themes of Cold War modernism. It did so truly as the Voice of America. It was the official spokes network of the United States government, and it was expressed in the voice and the style of American commercial broadcast journalism. Voice of America's mission was to provide a free and fair portrait of United States society, culture, and policies to foreign populations around the world. VOA saw the British Broadcasting Corporation as a model and sought to convey, to convey an even tone and a balanced presentation of the news so that audiences would not dismiss it as propaganda, which, which was characteristic of another American uh, radio project, which was Radio Free Europe, which was explicitly propagandistic. VOA's even-handed coverage, in fact, earned it the hostility of conservative legislators. The prevailing ethos at VOA, particularly after Eisenhower's election, was to avoid seeming propagandistic while actually propagandizing. During the Truman administration, the Voice of America covered art only minimally, but echoed the arguments that national and ethnic diversity characterized the American artistic scene and that modernism was fundamentally international. A report on the 1952 Pittsburgh International Art Exhibition, which is now known as the Carnegie International, stressed that the United States, of course, is such a melting pot that the exhibition shows that contemporary art, especially in its abstract phase, is not national, but universal. It could even be belittling at times, such as in a 1951 discussion on regionalism between painters Howard Gibbs, Vernon Smith, and Elliot Orr. These artists, who were described by the announcer as three of the better American modernists, praised the regionalist tradition and the variety it had brought to the nation's art, and then concluded by defending experimentation. Most painters, the announcer reassured his audience, are much more orderly and more rational than the layman traditionally gives them credit for being. Implicit in his attitude, of course, is the persistent prejudice that modernists, even the better kind, are unpredictable, wild-eyed bohemians countered by his disingenuous reassurance that some, in fact, aren't. In keeping with Eisenhower's desire to use Voice of America to provide a rounded portrait of American culture, coverage of all of the arts increased after 1953. 
But the new programming had to be careful not to be too daring or experimental or avant-garde. Because unlike the book, the art and the books programs, which were primarily aimed at cultural elites, VOA's program had to appeal to a broad audience in each target in, in each target nation. Intellectuals and, and elites, yes, but also to a popular segment of the audience who, surveys reported, preferred portraits of daily life in the US. The scripts then focus more on explaining the role of the arts in American cultural life than in, than in presenting the work or life of a particular artist. This is of course to be expected because painting doesn't make for very good radio. Such shows made subtle arguments that the arts, traditional and experimental, thrived in the US, were accessible to and popular among its audiences and citizens, and sparked lively discussions among an engaged and cultured populace. The idea that the individual is the ultimate source of creativity permeates the Cold War modernist project, and in this VOA was no different. In a forum on the visual arts, critic Bartlett Hayes insisted that the individual is the building block of American democratic society, and Lloyd Goodrich writes that art today is more individualistic than in the period of the old masters. This pluralistic art of ours, he concludes, is the appropriate expression of a democratic society, free and fluid, offering wide scope to individualism. Although it treated modernism respectfully, VOA saved some of its highest praise for works that straddled modernism and the middle brow. Among these was Archibald MacLeish's verse drama, J.B., a retelling of the Job story set in a shabby circus tent, which is largely forgotten and rarely produced today. But VOA ran a breathless feature on it in May 1958 Asking whether this work was new, perhaps asking whether this new work was perhaps a modern classic. Middlebrow paragon Thornton Wilder earned his own fawning profile in January 1958, uh, coinciding with the American television dramatization of *The Bridge of San Luis Rey*. These features epitomize the assimilation of modernism into the mainstream while not downplaying and in fact emphasizing the work's unconventional formal features, such as the verse dialogue in JB and the meta-theatricality of Wilder's Our Town, the narrator reassures listeners that these are not works with radical messages. Quite the contrary. According to Chiardi, the message of, of McLeish's play is the triumph of humanism. The Wilder profile as well insisted repeatedly that his works are universal that Wilder possesses a deep sense of the universal in the history of mankind. Outside of literature and painting, VOA tended to profile artists who had fundamentally changed the contours of their own chosen art form, often through modernistic formal techniques and stubborn devotion to an individual vision. Refuting the idea that popular acclaim is the only reward American artists seek, these features also point to the difficulty of their subject's work and the criticism they endured. Several stories on Frank Lloyd Wright emphasized his self-regard and prickliness. And one even quotes a critic of the Guggenheim Museum building saying that the building diminishes the pictures exhibited therein and the pictures diminish the building. Martha Graham lost her desire to be a virtuoso of the, of the conventional repertoire and forged a new kind of dance that is not always inviting or pleasant to the spectator. Detractors dismissed Alexander Calder's radical experimentation as sheer sensation and novelty for its own sake. Eugene O'Neill's long day's journey in tonight is pessimistic and Alfred Steichen's photographs don't shy away from ugliness. But each of these artists, the scripts make clear, followed their muses and made challenging art of enduring value. So taken as a whole, these profiles depict American artists as individualists, innovators who have not withered under critical and popular attacks and places them squarely in the tradition of modernist self-representation. The key point of my book is that Cold War modernism wasn't just a governmental operation. It was a public-private partnership involving high-minded people from the publishing industry, the business community, foundations and museums, and academia. A lot of them, like Nelson Rockefeller and William Casey actually crossed those divides between those sectors. The Congress for Cultural Freedom, which operated primarily in Europe, is primarily the most is probably the most famous private group involved in this cultural diplomacy. And I suspect that many people here know at least the broad outlines of its story. 
Created in 1950, largely by the Central Intelligence Agency and the British Information Research Division, which is one of their intelligence agencies, the Congress brought together European intellectuals, many of them former communists, to promote cultural freedom and modernist art. The Congress was hugely influential, particularly in Europe, until it imploded when its CIA roots were exposed in 1966 and much of its membership fled. And this is a photograph of the um, of the one of their first conferences, their, their initial conferences in, in Berlin. Um, and I'm just including this. Uh, they had their initial meeting at what was called the, the Titania Palace in Berlin, which was a, an old um, a, a theater. Uh, and the, the top picture is what the theater looked like in the 40s. The, the lower left is uh, uh, Sidney Hook speaking there. And then I was in Berlin in, in 2019 and I had to go to the building. So this is what it looks like now. I'm less interested in the uh, that aspect of the, the Congress, its CIA ties. Um, and I, if you are interested in that, Francis Stoner Saunders is, um, who paid the piper is really the definitive account of that. Then in how it used modernism in one of its projects, its English magazine called Encounter. Edited by the English poet Stephen Spender and the not yet neoconservative Irving Kristol, Encounter became a leading cultural magazine in Britain. Its mission was to be anti-communist, but not vulgarly so. And its pages memorialize modernism as a cultural high point from which we have fallen away. The mark of T.S. Eliot is everywhere in the journal Encounter, mostly as an untouchable eminence. To read Encounter, you'd think that modernism was just a set of hermetic monuments created by greats like Joyce and Wolfe and Eliot, not a movement that came about in revolutionary fervor and that was still, particularly in the United States, seen in some quarters as subversive and dangerous. But if Spender and Crystal mourn the death of modernism, another parallel magazine celebrated modernism as a vibrant tradition. In 1952, the young New Directions Books publisher, James Laughlin, asked his friend, Ford Foundation director and former University of Chicago president, Robert Hutchins, for $200,000 to start a magazine that would show the Europeans just how advanced American art and literature had become. Perspectives USA led off its first issue with Faulkner's Nobel speech, but that was generally as political as things got. The magazine, which was printed in German, Italian, French, and English, was not particularly interesting, unfortunately. It reprinted previously published material from American magazines like The Atlantic and The New Yorker, along with some original pieces, mostly appreciations of artists like Arthur Dove or E.E. E. Cummings. The, the next couple of photographs are uh, publicity shots that the Ford Foundation set up to promote um, Perspectives USA. I particularly like this one because the, they just they look like central casting French existentialists. In Perspectives, any sociopolitical content or even intent to modernism is absent. Modernism here is nothing but a collection of artistic techniques, stylistic practices. Granted, such innovation could never have taken place under communism. But unlike Encounter, Perspectives never makes that argument explicit. In, instead, the argument here is that the, United, the US had advanced art and literature that was certainly the equal of Europe's, and that thus the skeptical European intellectuals shouldn't fear that American hegemony would bring only Philistinery. If the magazine itself wasn't particularly interesting though, its parent organization was. Intercultural publications, the nonprofit that consisted essentially entirely of the magazine, brought together on its board of directors the worlds of literature through Lachlan, publishing, Alfred A. Knopf, business, Jack Hines, who of Hines Food Company, who was Lachlan's childhood friend from Pittsburgh, the Ford Foundation, and the national security state in the person of William J. Casey. So Casey was a diehard cold warrior, a working class Catholic from Long Island, he went to Fordham and served in the OSS during the war and eventually became CIA director. Whether Casey, who had not known Lachlan before this time, was actually representing the CIA when he was advising little startup, that Lachlan's little startup, isn't clear to me. Casey's biographer, Joseph Persico, denies it, but I'm not so certain. At this time, the lines between the Ford Foundation, the OSS, the CIA, and the State Department were very blurry. And my best guess is that Milton Katz, who was another Ford Foundation director, had suggested that Casey be included on the board as a condition of funding it. Katz had served under Casey in the OSS and had been brought to Ford Foundation on the recommendation of Paul Hoffman, a Marshall Plan administrator. 
Don't worry about keeping all these names straight. My point is just that these networks were dense, if only because of the world of East Coast power brokers was much, much smaller back then. Where Lachlan saw the magazine as a showcase for American modernism aestheticized, Casey, who was a practical man, but also the most vocal of the directors, which suggests to me that he might have been suggest uh, serving multiple masters, concerned himself with how the magazine portrayed middle-class America. The two came into conflict when Perspectives reprinted Mary McCarthy's 1947 essay, America the Beautiful, which both defended America's intellectual culture and denigrated our middle-class society in the most New York intellectual fashion possible. Casey was incensed and wanted the article pulled. When Lachlan refused, Casey suggested that they instead print something by management consultant Peter Drucker to emphasize the positives about capitalism. And they did in issue number three. So let's think about that for a minute. A magazine run by an avant-garde modernist publisher trying to show what is most cutting edge about American art and culture runs an article by Peter Drucker. Clearly, modernism wasn't what it used to be, making no, no compromise with the public taste in the words of Margaret Anderson's little review. Modernism had made its peace with the bourgeoisie. By the end of the 1950s, Cold War modernism had largely succeeded. Leftist intellectuals in Europe had overwhelmingly rejected Stalinism, and Soviet culture, particularly socialist realist art, held little appeal. New York, not Paris or London, was now the center of artistic ferment. The battlegrounds moved south and east to Latin America and Asia, to populations for whom modernism was not as appealing. At home, modernist styles, once seen as jarring and foreign, had become common in mainstream literature, in film, in decorative art, in consumer products. Like so many radical artistic movements before it and since, revolutionary modernism won its approval from the cultural establishment and moved from the ramparts to the museums and the account executives, Madison Avenue. But in that journey, it may have also helped the United States win the Cold War. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, that was great. Um, let's open it up to questions. Um, yeah, let's, you can either unmute yourself or, um, or put them, put your questions in the chat. Go ahead, Anna. Greg, thank you. That was amazing. Um, I know we're all thrilled that we turned in for Cold War modernism on this cold day. <laughs> So there's a joke we've been making at PAFA for the past few years since we started working on this project that I wanted to ask you about. Um, and we joke that John Roden was a CIA operative. And we're kind of joking, but we're kind of not. And I wonder if you could just um, talk a little bit about that concept. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I would say almost certainly not, <laughs> but, um, the lines, the lines were a little blurry, um, and there was a, the most notorious examples of, of actual CIA involvement in in arts and culture. Certainly, were through the Congress for Cultural Freedom, and and programs like that, the National Student Foundation, and, and a lot of those were sort of sensationally exposed in, in the '60s. But I think it's important to to understand that the CIA of the '50s wasn't the CIA that most of us know and are familiar with from kind of the, the post 70s revelations about it. It was it was largely populated by Ivy Leaguers who were very cultured, uh, who uh, were very interested in the arts. Um, I, as, as Lori mentioned, I'm writing a, a biography of a man who was um, both uh, deeply involved in art and poetry and was asked to be the the deputy director of the CIA for counterintelligence. Uh, they many of those people uh, moved between those sectors, and they and saw no distinction between them. Um, so I, again, I would I would call people's attention to Francis Saunders' uh, book the uh, on who paid the piper. But Francis actually just and this is something that would very much interest your audience. There's a BBC Three documentary that just aired this Sunday called Turning Picasso 
which is all about the CIA's efforts to try to get Picasso to come to the United States to an art exhibition in, in the late 50s and declare his allegiance to not to the U.S., but to sort of like freedom because he had been associated with the Communist Party. So, um, so yeah, I think that the, the most the way to view that is that the, the CIA saw art as its as its purview because the CIA was populated by a lot of people who had like advanced liberal arts degrees and loved art and collected art, uh, um, but were also more than happy to go try to overthrow the Guatemalan and Iranian governments as, as they did in the 1950s. I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. That That's fascinating. Sarah? Thank you so much for the lecture. It was so interesting. Um, I was just kind of curious, like towards the end, you kind of talked about um, kind of the involvement and kind of reaching out to like Latin America and like the Middle East. Um, and so it kind of reminds me of um, with Rockefeller when he asked like Diego Rivera to like paint his like, um, I forgot his building or whatever. Um, yeah, and I was just kind of curious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I was just kind of interested in like, I guess, not necessarily your opinion, but kind of like your, re um, kind of what you think the reasoning behind that, because I remember you mentioned kind of like MoMA and other art institutes talking about more leftist art and how like it's more formalistic rather than like meaning. And do you think that there was a connection there? Maybe like, I'm not sure, but I just was just curious on what you think about that. So, so Nelson Rockefeller is really interesting uh, figure here because he's an art collector, he's the president of MoMA, but then he he, he gets this, this uh, governmental position called the uh, Coordinator of Inter-American Affairs, which, which the president basically, Roosevelt, basically put him in charge of American cultural outreach in Latin America, which we'd never had before. We just sort of ignored Latin America or you know sent our troops down there. And Rockefeller was really interested in developing cultural and intellectual ties with Latin America, particularly with Mexico, which is which is one of the things that turned him on to uh, Diego Rivera, uh, and so he, through both his involvement in the arts and his involvement in, in, in cultural diplomacy, set, starts realizing that what was the, what was being called the third world is of increasing importance, and that American cultural diplomacy needed to start reaching out to them long before most cultural diplomats did in. When we're talking about the, the 40s and the 50s, America's focus, the United States' focus was was almost entirely on Europe. Uh, that was where the action was. That was what was happening. Uh, so Rockefeller is really ahead of its time, ahead of his time, in in thinking about Latin America as a place that we should be extending our cultural footprint in what he would have seen as a very friendly way, um, not simply in, in the militaristic way. Roden then comes into this, uh, and he he's important because he comes into this in the in the fifties, when again State Department and USA's focus is primarily on Eastern Europe and primarily on, on Western Europe, but they say, well, there there seems to be something happening in in Japan. There seems to be something happening in Korea, so they send him to both places to talk about American art, and then Africa was a was just an afterthought to all these people, and they sent him there. Like largely because he was black, but they also sent people like Langston Hughes uh, to Africa to try to be American cultural diplomats. Uh, James Baldwin was proposed as a cultural diplomat, but they ended up rejecting him because because they couldn't control what he was going to say. Um, but it it has a lot to do with the sense that by about the time of the Berlin Wall, uh, the Soviets have lost the propaganda battle in Western Europe. Like very few people are going pro-Soviet after the Berlin Wall goes up. And so the United States sort of declares victory there and says, well, let's start thinking about these other battlefields, the Middle East, East Asia, China, Korea, and eventually Latin America, which they really get involved in, well, obviously Vietnam, but then Latin America, which becomes their um, obsession in the 70s and, and 80s, and 80s, which is when I came into the scene as a kind of like young activist. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, that does. Thank you so much. Bill? Hey, hey, Greg, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah, I just ate it up um, and uh, I have a million questions, um, uh, but I think I'll start with, um, I did some 
some research back in my academic days about the relationship between um, queerness and um, popular and high culture in the 1950s. Um, and, you know, I couldn't help thinking about the relationship to queerness um, in in some of the um, stories that you were telling. Certainly Stephen Spender was, um, uh, you know, I wouldn't say openly gay, but he, he, he wasn't exactly closeted. Um, and, you know, I've, and, and it seems like it seems likely and I'm, I'm sort of interested if if you agree with this, that there was a kind of uh, a tricky balance or relationship between homosexuality at this time and who is involved in in these cultural practices that you're talking about, because, of course, homosexuality was demonized and you know was linked to communism in many ways. Right. At this time. Um, but at the same time, there were a lot of, you know, as we all know, J. Edgar Hoover, Whitaker Chambers, there were all these radical anti-communist, rabid anti-communists, right, who were actually closeted, closeted queer people. So I guess I'm asking, did this issue of queerness come up in your research and, you know, this kind of, you know, this sort of tricky relationship that all these people must have had with it? It it didn't come up in this book as much um although when you have people like spender and then spender as you as i'm sure you know is part of this crowd of people including auden and isherwood who are, who are all basically kind of out or right. operating where in a isla lyons was a photographer that was also part of that circle um pretty much completely out um and sort of in and out of this cultural diplomacy program, I think um, particularly the people who are kind of at these elevated cultural levels, um, who who are you know Boston Brahmins or, or come from wealthy families in New York, and it, they're they're a lot more accepting of of it. Uh, than would be sort of the William Casey's the next step down, but it didn't come out. It, it wasn't. It didn't come out as much in in my research for this book, uh, which was so much more heavily focused on uh, sort of governmental programs. But I will say it's it, this biography of, of Pearson. It's all over the place because he's again from this cultural stratum, and he's dealing yeah. with artists and writers. In fact, H.D. the the poet and Briar the are, are two of his closest friends in the world, and so operating in a world where where everybody sort of knows that, and no one talks about it, no one names it. Um, but no one has any problem with it um, and but is completely complicit in the really harsh repression that that ramps up that we see in the or in the early 50s. I would I just can't recommend highly enough um, this book by I think James Kerchick is his name. who wrote a book, uh, the, the Secret History of Gay Washington. Um, I don't know if anyone's know that, but came out last year. I don't know. It. Oh, cool. Oh, man, it's a good book. Oh, it's a you, you love that book. Right. Okay, you're yeah. interested in that. Secret City, Secret City, that's what it's called. Uh, so some of you may have read that, but it's just a wonderful history of basically gay Washington um, starting about in the 40s and, and coming through to the to the 80s. Ah, sounds amazing. Um, one more quick comment, I think, is um, uh, uh, that I, I actually I mean, I've always, you know, I've, just, I've always admired the Kennedy administration for their kind of remarkable support of the arts and um it um it it always seemed to me like it was in many ways authentic and genuine you know in terms of who they were as people as you described the sort of you know ivy league educated elite but as you were talking i was thinking in some ways it's the it's the final victory lap of what you're talking about right <laughs> that the kennedy administration you know so leaned in to promoting the arts um as political tools yeah um, and in, and they certainly won the propaganda battle for for whether communism or capitalism was going to be the representation of uh you know, intellectual and artistic elitism um, and they they sent people like john updike over uh over to do to be like like Roden to be with one of these cultural ambassadors they sent they sent updike over there 
they sent Ellison over there. One of the things I didn't talk about in this talk, but I think many people are familiar with, is uh, there was a lot of musicians involved in these programs. But those are largely under Eisenhower. That's that's the thing that surprised mm -hmm. me the most in writing this book was how much respect I, I developed for, for Eisenhower as a kind of internationalist, broad thinking. And uh, I think in some ways, Kennedy stepped back from from what Eisenhower wanted to do in terms of like cultural exchange. And in fact, that, mm. that he had a real falling out with uh, Senator Fulbright from Arkansas, who you know, originally the Fulbright program, because Fulbright oh. thought that, that Eisenhower was completely on his side. And then he's like, well, it's going to be great to get a Democrat in the White House. And Kennedy mm. pulled back on a lot of that stuff and, and really pissed yeah. Fulbright. We have some we have some great questions in the chat. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Harry asks, how did the good neighbor policy fit into this overall sense of modernism? That's a really good question. Uh, I I think the best way I, I I can't answer that in any huge detail, but I think the the best way um, to illustrate that would be both with with Nelson Rockefeller and the creation of the coordinator of international of coordinator of inter American affairs, where um, Roosevelt says we need to start actually embodying the good neighbor policy, and then the influence of um, a woman in the State Department, who, her name was Muna Lee. Uh, and she, there were very few women in the State Department, especially very few women who had high ranking positions, but Muna Lee was an important State Department official. And she was married to Luis Munoz Marin, who was the governor of uh, Puerto Rico. And so she was really pushing for the United States in the 40s to really start reaching out to Latin America not, and not just for political and economic reasons, not just, you know, our cultural diplomacy consists of having a United Fruit set up a plantation there but reaching out to them uh, with cultural installations. Um, but but that is something that I, I can't answer in any detail. I would love to know more about. Um, Thomas asked, did states or CIA sponsor or encourage performances by American jazz greats in Europe or VA, VOA or Radio Free Europe broadcasts? Yeah, so that's, um, and I just alluded to that a minute ago. Um, they did, and they sent uh, Dave Brubeck, uh, Louis Armstrong, Dizzy Gillespie. They sent productions of Porgy and Bess. Uh, mm -hmm. They would send them to Eastern Europe, but then they would send them. They sent them to Poland. They sent them to Yugoslavia. And one of the things you learn when you start looking at this in detail is, is Yugoslavia was not Soviet bloc. It was communist, but it was not. It had broken from the Soviet bloc. So, and they had a somewhat looser uh, artistic culture there. So that you were able to get away with more. And that's one of the things I talk about in my essay about Rodin, because he, he saw that when he went to Yugoslavia. But they would even send uh, Dizzy Gillespie to the Soviet Union. Uh, and if you, uh, there was a, there's a Dave Brubeck record. It's called The Real Ambassador. And it was him writing about, and it's, it's, it's Brubeck as uh, a pianist, but it's sung as well. He's writing about his work as a cultural ambassador. And it's a duet between him and Louis Armstrong, talking about their work being sent on these jazz tours. Um, the, the work I, if you're interested in this further, and there's a lot to say about it, the work I would recommend is Penny Von Eschen's book, Satchmo Blows Up the World, which is a which is a chronicle of all the musicians who were sent over there. Uh, and Penny's a really good researcher. And uh, But there was also um, on VOA, there was a, the most popular program in VOA was uh, called Jazz, I think it was called Jazz USA. And it was hosted by a man named Willis Conover, uh, who was just a jazz ambassador and DJ and known all the way around the world. Um, and um, Jazz USA, or I may be getting the program wrong, uh, was somewhat influential in in uh, Afrobeat music. Uh, a lot of, because that, that program was circulated in Africa, a lot of African musicians picked up, started adopting sort of jazz uh, techniques. And that's one of the influences on Afrobeat music that we see emerging in places like Nigeria and Ghana. Okay. I have to ask this question, and we have very few minutes left, but I just have to ask it. So Mar Marco um, Juarez Cruz asks, thank you so much for this inter interesting presentation. As these cultural policies had an international scope, how did non-U.S. artists respond to these attempts to, to conduct them ideologically? Were they able to maintain some artistic agency despite being sponsored by U.S. projects? That's that was the the question that everybody was had to deal with um and even the u.s artists who were being sent abroad to what degree were they being 
control, to what degree were they being told what they could say and what they couldn't say. The vast majority of them report that there were no controls being put on them, that they were able to say whatever they wanted to say, but they were chosen carefully. And we we see that in some, and you can see this on the PAFA website in the, in the archival documents about Roden. When they evaluate him, they say he's not the kind of guy who's going to cause a stir. I mean, he'll answer frankly and honestly if you ask him about the racial situation, but he's not going over there to cause a stir about that. There was obviously a huge amount of suspicion among uh, foreign populations when the United States, particularly the State Department, would trot out artists who would talk about U.S. freedoms. And there was a great deal of skepticism among uh, local populations, particularly in Western Europe. Um, a lot of artists in Eastern Europe were pretty, by that time, pretty hungry for any kind of taste of artistic freedom. Um, but yeah, and and I mean, I don't know if I completely understand your uh, the question um, about non-U.S. artists responding to the attempts to conduct them ideologically. I, I hope that I've I've answered that. Um, yeah, just in that sense. Um, they, they were skeptical, but I think the U.S. artists were not being controlled in the way that, for instance, when a um, uh, Russian conductor, um, now I can't remember, Shostakovich, was brought over uh, to the United States for a, for a peace conference and was was sort of shadowed by his KGB handlers. And when he said something slightly wrong in one of the meetings in this 1949 conference, uh, was hustled back to the hotel and not seen again. Well, thank you, Greg. This was incredible. Um, I just want to give you a save the date um, in the future. Greg is going to be here for our Rodin Catalog Symposium February 10th. That's Saturday, February 10th. Put it on your calendar for 2024. Please come back for that. Um, and I want to also I put something in the chat. We are having hosting um, the, um, uh, the Anna Sally Greenwood um discovery lecture and i put the wrong um oh yeah no i did it's the opportunity i did put that one in um that's next thursday it's going to be at papa um and i wanted to invite people who are in the area to come to it it's going to be a fascinating conversation about the stewardship and the partnership between crystal art bridges and fisk university on that um collection and um so please come if you can Dr. Barnheisel, this was amazing. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you here in person in February. Oh, and I'm looking forward to it too. Thank you. Thanks all of you for listening and uh, come see the exhibition. If you haven't seen Roden's work, it's really very moving um, uh, and it's fantastic. So, And I just want to encourage all of you, the, the lecture Lori mentioned next week, it's about Alfred Stieglitz collection at Fisk University. So if you like modernism, you should come to that. We're going to keep the Roden exhibition open late for you to come after work. And we're going to have free drinks before the lecture. So boom. <laughs> and our shop is open. You can do holiday shopping. You can do it all at PAFA next Thursday. So please join us. I'd be there if I didn't have to give a final. Say that again, sorry. I'd be there if I didn't have to administer a final. Yeah, sorry, sorry. We'll take care. Happy no. holidays, everyone, if I don't see you before. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Greg. It was great. Okay. It was fantastic, thank you. Cheers. Bye.